Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all in this conference. This year's conference is on the crisis in the Great Lakes region of Africa, and it is on the theme, the conflict in the Great Lakes region of Africa, origin and solutions. We have a parallel economy of white plunder and exploitation. And who are the people that are punished? It's always the black guy who's, who's responsible for atrocities in Africa. It's always that Qaddafi or that Idi Amin or that Yoweri Museveni, which in fact it is in this case. But above Museveni, who, who makes it possible for Museveni to stay in power all these years? It's not Kikweta. It, it, it's not uh, Mugabe who makes it possible. It's on a much higher level. So that's why I talk about the black African fall guys who are always blamed and brought down for their part in the violence. And they have a part in this hierarchy. They have a part. But, but it's the white guys at the top. And they're mostly guys and they're mostly white. Until now, the international community is quiet about these evidences. People who come, who cross the border, who are Burundians, you take around 500 people and they say we were in Rwanda, recruited, and we have been trained there, and they gave us weapons, and you seize everything, and you show them to this international, so-called international community, but nothing happened. We have some Rwandan spies on Burundian soil that have been caught. We have people who try to attack uh, the chief of Burundian army and they have been caught trying to cross the border between Burundi and Rwanda. And we have also weapons that have been seized uh, in a car uh, of UNHCR. This car was used by someone from UNHCR coming from Rwanda every week with weapons. All those evidences have been given to the so-called international community, but so far, nothing is happening. What we do at the Africa Center for International Law and Accountability um, is really in fostering dialogue as research and education organization. Uh, but my talk is just generally about, of course, the Great Lakes region. Um, it is the lower tempo of this <laughs> forum um, because it is forward-looking, it is looking at uh, current situations as well as forward-looking uh, measures that might be taking to ensure that there is a democracy, democratic governance, that there is peace, and that citizens can hold governments accountable. I know many people who couldn't come here because they were afraid of their family left home. But it's very unfortunate at this hour in 2016, we are still hearing that genocide deniers. Everything is about Kagame, Kagame, Kagame. That's the problem of the region. It's not Rwanda. The problem of the region is not Kagame. After the genocide, Burundi, as our neighboring country, we share history. We should, at least Burundians and the Rwandans, come together as we've been in the ages. I'm speaking as a Rwandan, the region who lives in this country. I'm not speaking on behalf of any government. As I said, I'm a proud Rwandan. Take a good example of what's happening in Rwanda. We are moving on. We are still firm. People are united. We repatriated the refugees. <laughs> We repatriated the refugees. They come home. Tutsi and the Hutu are living together. There is uh, I take advantage to respond to one person who said Rwandans are united. They aren't. They aren't because what I say and uh, what that person said shows how divided we are. Keith, you say that uh, in Rwanda there was a, uh, a, a conflict. Why? is that there is only, you are talking about only one side who has been killed. Are you trying to deny genocide? Because you're talking about Hutus who have been killed. 
Are you trying to say that there were not two things who have been killed? This is question number one. Number two, we say that this is a Great Lakes conference. And in your presentation, you say that you're going to talk about Burundi, you're going to talk about DRC, you're going to talk about uh, uh, Rwanda and Uganda. Could you also bring into the picture the whole picture of East African? How do I assess the situation in the Great Lakes? Well, I, I want to also clarify that someone asked that I suggested that I didn't say that Tutsis, I said Tutsis were not being killed. I said two to 300,000 Tutsis were killed in Rwanda in 1994. Two to 300,000, maybe 400,000. Let's say it's 500,000. That still leaves 1.1 million to 800,000 people that died, and they were Hutus. The audience had the impression that uh, you were speaking about Kagame and not on the Great Lakes. Why don't you speak on Great Lakes? Anyway, back to your question. I don't understand the question about the greater, the greater situation. So what, the way I would look at the Great Lakes today is, is somebody trying to get me to talk about the Congo? Were you trying to get me to talk about the Congo? But my question is, we, Congolese peoples, we didn't kill people in Rwanda. We didn't participate in genocide. We didn't kill people in Uganda. Who is killing people in Congo and why? Uh, from 1997 up to today, they are a genocide in Congo. Almost 8 million people died in Congo. Nobody is talking about it. Who is killing people in Congo and why? That is my question. Uh, the, the complexity of the situation is that we have international human rights organizations basically covering up some of the real facts and then pointing at, you know, Nkruziza as, as being the main perpetrator of violence in the region. And meanwhile, these agents of Kagame and Museveni and, and so-called Mr. Kabila in Congo are committing massive atrocities across each of their countries and across the region. We have hit and run squads coming from Rwanda and into the Congo and, and attacking, committing atrocities and rapes all the time. We have Kagame and Rwanda troops up now in Central African Republic and in Darfur and in Somalia committing atrocities there. And we have Ugandan military operating in Iraq with the United States. I mean, Nazi Germany was a model of uh, science and uh, development and uh, architecture in 1945, 44, 43. And Rwanda is a model of great business dealings as far as a nasty, corrupt interna international system of business operations and corporations and corporate crimes and uh, corporate criminals. It's a perfect model of that. Rwandan soldiers don't have a barracks. How many people know this? They wander around the country. They have no barracks. They infiltrate the population everywhere you go. There are agents working for the government of Kagame everywhere. You can't say anything in Rwanda. Susan Thompson is an academic from the United States who, who, who is the expert on this, as far as experts go. Susan Thompson went to Rwanda believing exactly what uh, most people believe about Rwanda. It's a wonderful country. It's been developed. It's a model of development and business and, and uh, safety. And uh, she found out very quickly, talking to the people, that you can't talk to the people safely. Uh, what I specifically want to bring up is uh, abuses by state security forces, particularly acts of torture by the state security forces in the SNR um, uh, Bureau arbitrary arrests by police and enforced disappearance. These are common occurrences in Burundi today. This is well documented by international as well as local organizations um, and also in the UN report. Uh, so I can't possibly raise all the questions I have to you today, uh, but I want to really highlight these cases of torture by SNR agents. Um, and particularly the case of Estras Ndikumana, the RFI and AFP uh, reporter based in Bujumbura, uh, who was taken uh, to the SNR and tortured within their premises for two hours. Even in this really high profile case, no one has been arrested, there has been no prosecution. This is just one of many cases, but even in this really high profile case, uh, for the sake of the audience, I want to ask you, if the situation is calm, 
and the court system is up to par, why is nothing happening? Human Rights Watch, right? I've been working with Human Rights Watch for many years. Before, it was Nela Goshal. Nela Goshal has been chased from Burundi because we were able to catch some emails between Nela Goshal and the opposition saying, I will go to the State Department next week and you will see, we are going to raise fire. The next report will be really terrific. So she was exchanging SMSs and emails with radical opponents. We were able to, to get those informations and to chase her. So you cannot say that Human Rights Watch is independent organization, especially in Burundi. I have been working closely with Karina. We had a debate, it was in Deutsche Welle. And I told her, the day you will talk about what some journalists have done in Burundi, because you have evidences that we have given to you, that day I will understand that you are really working independently. You are not taking sides. If you can read The Guardian, released 6th April 2014, The Guardian, they say that President Nkurunziza is distributing machetes to 100,000 young people across Burundi. But this was really a rumor. My name is Ahlam Abu Zaid from Sudan Embassy. I'm ambassador of Sudan in Oslo. Uh, I thank you, the organizer, and you especially for this invitation, and the Balinist also. Um, uh, my question to Mr. Kiss Snow uh, regarding, uh, he said that uh, the, the interest of the international community or some countries to African. So my question when uh, the foreign intervention stops in our region, uh, not only in Sudan, but also in the region and also in Africa. Uh, I ask this simple question because one of the panelists said that maybe our, the, uh, the main solution for our problems is a dialogue. Uh, we have a dialogue in Sudan, we call it national dialogue. It ends with a document. Uh, uh, so many uh, uh, political parties, they, they join this uh, dialogue, but at the end, when we reach to the conclusion of this dialogue, we face a problem that uh, some of the arms group has been hosted by our neighbor countries, is supporting uh, them not to involve in this negotiation and in, in the dialogue. Uh, so do you think that the, the, the national dialogue should be accepted only by the, uh, by the domestic parties or also by the international community? It's a very complex uh, situation. Unlike in domestic law, the only way a person will be brought before court in a criminal prosecution is by, you know, on the order of the attorney general or minister of justice. So there's only one way street. And if you live in a society, you have actually signed on to the social contract of obeying the laws within the state because you are in the territory. Um, in President al Bashir's case, as you rightly said, uh, Sudan has not ratified the Rome Statute, the ICC. In fact, 24 other countries in Africa have not. I think 20. The last one is about Rwanda and the you know, uh, extension of third terms. Um, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, when there is a perception of a good leader, just like in our traditional societies, we had the kingship system. When you have a good king, the king 
may be ruling for life. Because they think, oh, he's a great guy. Um, that's the danger you have, I think, in Rwanda, too. That in spite of President Kagame's great jobs, great works, building the country again, uh, there's also the tendency that it could slip into him to want to do what he has done. Law is law. Once he's able to get the law to back him, there's very little you can do because he has to have grounds. Because, um, when I received the invitation, it was about talking about dialogue and uh, the truth about the situation in the region. What we're seeing here, we're inviting Cave, negating what's happened, what's, what everybody has been uh, uh, describing and, and confirming, and nobody's from Rwanda, no, nobody's from the other part of the, of, the, of the truth. But the fact is, the organizers invited uh, people from the Rwandan embassy to come and sit on this panel and they refused. Instead, they just send a few people to argue and complain about me being a genocide denier and him being an apologist for torture in Burundi. And the people